Welcome to PTE Updates. For more video subscribe our channel. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, uh, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously, something had to be done. And in 1956, a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. This addressed the pollution from factories and the smog soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it. It's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries. And although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains and planes than in the 1950s. And this is now the main source of air pollution around the world. OK, to help you with your research, I just wanted to give you some tips today on using focus groups. These are groups of people that you get together to find out about their opinions and attitudes. For example, to review a piece of work or just basically provide some collective input to help you with whatever you're researching. First of all, how large should a focus group be? Well, I would say that an ideal number of participants is around six or seven. If it's any bigger, what quite often happens is they break into side conversations and the focus is lost. If it's any smaller, you may not get the range of views that you need to get a really good discussion. Secondly, it's important that you have a moderator for the group who's able to facilitate and guide the discussions. The moderator must ensure that everyone participates and stop anyone dominating. And also, the moderator needs to make sure that the discussions don't go off in the wrong direction. And thirdly, in order to help the group focus on what's required, some basic materials should be used, particularly to kick-start the discussions. This may be in the form of pictures, photos, diagrams, graphs, etc. And will help the group to understand the context of what needs to be discussed. Hello everyone. Today's lecture is about setting up a website. I'm going to be focusing on things that you need to consider to ensure your website really adds value to the people using it. So, there are three main areas you need to think about. The first and most important thing is who is your target audience. When you're creating a new website, you really need to think about who the users are and what information they'll be looking for. What we do when we set up websites is to group users based on their needs. So, for a website in the academic community, for example, we may have groups such as researchers and administrators, and this helps us design the site and add information that is relevant to each group. The second point is accessibility. The main thing here is to ensure your website can be found. And you can do this by making sure it can be reached from areas on the web where your target audience are also active. So this may mean providing links on other websites or maybe using social media. And thirdly, retention. Making sure your target audience return to your website regularly. You do this by ensuring it gives them a reason to come back. So it's important to keep the site up to date and make sure it provides the latest news and interesting information and so on. I've been asked to speak today about the purpose of museums and I think that's something we often take for granted, that we have museums and we need museums. But with so much information available now online, people have access to whatever it is they want to know, so I think we need to consider carefully just what it is that we expect of our museums today, what makes them relevant in the information age. Clearly, We've got to move beyond the early 20th century concept of a warehouse full of old, remarkable, untouchable objects. 
This warehouse idea does very little to inspire people. What museum professionals need to do, what they should be doing, is make their collections and programmes work towards the purpose of education. So whether that means having more hands-on exhibits, becoming involved with other community organisations, they should be doing whatever it takes to think about their visitors, to engage people, to educate them. And in that way, they can be instruments of social change. If they have knowledge and understanding of the people who visit, and the people they want to come and visit, they can take this as a starting point for providing exhibitions and services that are relevant to people's lives. I suppose more and more people are starting to see graffiti as a form of art. Now, there are still many who would beg to differ, and they'd point to the destructive scribblings that we see on our bus shelters and our public buildings. These often take the form of tags, which are fancy scribble-like versions of someone's name or nickname. Tags generally have no aesthetic appeal, and they are the scourge of the high street shopkeeper in many a town. I can certainly see where the shopkeepers and property owners are coming from. But the fact is, graffiti has been around for a very long time indeed. People left their mark on cave walls back in prehistoric times, and it's been found too on ancient monuments in Egypt and Rome. But New York-style graffiti, which is really the forerunner of a lot of the graffiti that's getting done now, New York graffiti took off in the late 1960s. That's when the advent of the spray can allowed the humble tag to evolve into more complex styles. In the mid to late 70s, subway trains became the new forum for graffiti artists to display their skills. For many young people, it became a medium to express their disillusionment with a system from which they felt excluded. Now, of course, the art establishment embraces graffiti artists, and some of these artists have actually taken on cult status. We often think of technology and invention and research as being somehow more sophisticated a proposition than nature. But actually, when we think about it, there are lots of really useful concepts that technology can take from the natural world. People are beginning to remember that other organisms on Earth are doing things in a very similar way to what we need to do. And they're looking closely at what we can learn from nature. Take the bright screens on our mobile phones. Now, this brightness, this effect that they've managed to achieve there, came partly as a result of research into the iridescence of the wings of butterflies and the anti-reflective coatings that moths have on their eyes. And it doesn't end there. They're looking at what makes a spider's web so strong, how glowworms produce light with almost zero energy. The list goes on. And this area of research is called biomimicry. That's bio, as in biology or life, and mimicry copying or imitating. It's a very interesting field of study.
So today, we're continuing to talk about the social history of foodstuffs, and we're going on to consider next the importance of salt and the significant role it has played. Salt was a highly valued commodity in ancient times, not because it made food taste nicer, but because of the way it could be used to preserve food. This meant that people were not so dependent on seasonal variations in what was available for them to eat. They could preserve what they produced and consume it as required. It also meant that food could be transported long distances. Salt was not easy to obtain, and so prices for it were high. It was often necessary to transport it long distances, and it is believed that one of the reasons for building some of the roads that led to the ancient city of Rome was to make it easier to bring salt to the city from various parts of the Roman Empire. Roman rulers took financial advantage of the population's need for salt, when they wanted to raise money for some war or another, they raised the price of salt. Elsewhere, salt was important too. In Africa, for example, caravans consisting of up to 40,000 camels are said to have traveled 400 miles across the Sahara to transport salt to the inland markets of places like Timbuktu. to start by talking a bit about electric vehicles. Although we tend to think of electric cars as being something completely modern, they were, in fact, some of the earliest types of motorised vehicle. At the beginning of the 20th century, electric cars were actually more popular than cars with an internal combustion engine, as they were more comfortable to ride in. However, as cars fuelled by petrol increased in importance, electric cars declined. The situation became such that electric vehicles were only used for certain specific purposes, as forklift trucks, ambulances and urban delivery vehicles, for example. Although electricity declined in use in road vehicles, it steadily grew in importance as a means of powering trains. Switzerland, for example, was quick to develop an electrified train system, encouraged in this, no doubt, by the fact that it had no coal or oil resources of its own. Nowadays, there is renewed interest in electricity as a means of powering road vehicles. Why is this the case? Well, undoubtedly, economic reasons are of considerable importance. The cost of oil has risen so sharply that there is a strong financial imperative to look for an alternative. However, there are also environmental motivations. Emissions from cars are blamed in large part for, among other things, the destruction of the ozone layer and the resultant rise in temperatures in the polar regions. A desire not to let things get any worse is also encouraging research into designing effective electric transport. So today we're going to talk about children's literature and the role it plays in society. Throughout history, adults have used the power of stories to entertain and amuse their children. But stories are not used merely to entertain youngsters. They have a significant educational purpose. They serve to teach the moral values of their society. In sociological terms, stories are one of the means by which children are socialised. How does this work in practice? Well, it often makes use of heroes, the characters in the stories who the children will admire and want to be like. The heroes of children's stories, therefore, exemplify the qualities valued by that society. They will typically demonstrate courage in the face of difficulty 
honesty, consideration for others, loyalty to their family and friends, a respect for work and so on. You can see this happening from the fables of ancient societies through fairy tales and folk tales right up to modern day children's stories. For example, the hard-working ant in Aesop's fable is shown to succeed in comparison with the grasshopper who spends the summer singing and has nothing to eat when winter comes. Similarly, it is Cinderella, the honest, hard-working sister, who wins the prince rather than her cruel, lazy stepsisters. However, there is still usually something to entertain children, even in the most morally instructive of stories. Public lands in the U.S. are managed with two goals in mind, protecting biodiversity and providing people with recreational opportunities, a chance to connect with nature. But sometimes those two goals are at odds, especially if recreation, activities like hiking or hunting, disrupts wild animals enough to alter their use of those landscapes. Indeed, several years ago, a study done in California found that hikers had a negative impact on wildlife. And that kind of sounded a bit of an alarm in, uh, to us as, as uh, wildlife biologists and as people who like to go hiking ourselves. Wildlife biologist Roland Kays of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences at NC State University. We were pretty worried that this, that this problem was as bad as it seemed from that study and as widespread and was widespread that, um, you know, there could be a real conflict between outdoor recreation, and wildlife conservation. To find out, Kays and his team enlisted the help of more than 350 volunteer citizen scientists who deployed camera traps at nearly 2,000 sites within 32 protected areas in six different states. Roughly half of the areas allowed hunting and half did not. What they discovered was something of a relief. We found relatively minor uh, impacts of hunting and hiking on wildlife. It's not that human activities didn't impact wildlife at all, of course. Heavily hunted species, like white-tailed deer, gray squirrels, and raccoons, were photographed somewhat less often in hunted areas. Coyotes showed up more often in hunted areas, and while most species didn't avoid hiking trails, the predators actually preferred them. But they did find something that had a much bigger impact on wildlife. Habitat quality. The best predictor of wildlife abundance was not human activity, but factors like forest connectivity, nearby housing density, and the amount of adjacent agriculture. The results were published in the Journal of Applied Ecology. And they suggest that outdoor recreation, a $646 billion industry in the U.S., is currently managed in a sustainable way, but also that protecting the scattered patches of wild habitat that do remain in the U.S. is vital, both for wildlife and for people. Recreation, including hunting and hiking, and wildlife conservation can coexist in the same place at the same time. And we can go out there and enjoy nature, enjoy the woods, hope to catch a glimpse of wildlife without worrying about hurting the populations in the process. Women scientists at research universities still face barriers in hiring and promotion, and the U.S. is thus being deprived of an important source of scientific talent. Those are the findings in a report titled Beyond Bias and Barriers, Fulfilling the Potential of Women in Academic Science and Engineering. The report was issued this week by the National Academy of Science and Associated Institutions. Yale biophysics and biochemistry professor Joan Stites served on the committee that wrote the report. It's not overt prejudice, but rather the accumulation of a lot of little things that add up to discourage women. The report notes that women science faculty are paid less and promoted more slowly despite comparable productivity as men. It includes some two dozen recommendations to try to address the situation. I hope that it won't be like so many reports that have gone before it, where 10 years later, people look around and see that really nothing's happened.
Researchers from Children's Hospital in Boston were curious about the links between the flu and air travel. After all, one infected person can spread an outbreak from Miami to Seattle in hours. So the researchers looked at two different government statistics. They examined flu records between 1996 and 2005, and they also collected government estimates of the number of people traveling by airplane in those years. Well, in every year, the number of flu cases peaked between February 15th and 19th, except for 2001, when the peak date was March 2nd, almost two weeks later. Of course, in 2001, there was no air travel in the days after September 11th, and traffic was down even after flights resumed. So it looks like staying home helped keep the flu from spreading. The findings, published in the journal Public Library of Science Medicine, could inform decision-making in the event of a big flu epidemic. And what great revenge against the perpetrators of the September 11th attacks. We use data we wouldn't have had otherwise to control disease and save lives. Apes, for example, gorillas and chimpanzees, probably have the potential for being much smarter than their current environment requires them to be. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting notion. So you think that, and you do see this, according to the article, when a great ape is adopted in a human family and, right. is, and is required to do more human things, clearly the potential for that intelligence was there. Yeah. So, so the idea is, of course, that um, inputs, uh, put it like this, you're not born intelligent. You're made intelligent because of inputs. There has to be something there, some infrastructure. But if you don't fill it, if you don't develop it. And as you know, the brain is extremely plastic, and that's also true for primate brains. So you, you need to, to have these inputs. Social inputs enhance the signal-to-noise ratio. But of course, it really depends on what those social inputs are. Uh, great ape inputs are not human inputs. So you might call it the bootstrapping problem in the sense that if you could somehow, and that's what we do experimentally, um, increase the efficiency of those inputs, show these animals things that they would not normally see in the wild, then, of course, it turns out that with that same equipment, if you, if you, if you uh, prime it properly, so to speak, uh, you can actually reach much higher levels of cognitive performance, and that's in the end. You know, the, the expressed, realized intelligence is in the end what natural selection sees. The fact that they still have these big brains in the wild and they do relatively for us, uh, not so intelligent things with it is simply because of the nature of the inputs. They can't make those inputs any better than they are. If you can, then you, you can achieve much greater intellectual performance with the same brain. And of course, we are also talking about various species here who already have the potential for pretty high intelligence. You cannot teach a cat to interact the same way as you can teach a great ape to interact. Absolutely. And, but and the other thing that it actually shows you is that if, if you would compare, say, uh, an orangutan or a chimpanzee in the wild with a human hunter-gatherer, you would see massive differences. And yet, you could, now that we do these kinds of experiments, you could see that the differences are actually not as big because with a grade A brain, if properly uh, receiving proper inputs developmentally, you can actually achieve levels that are not as far removed as the human level. And so you could see how evolution had a, an easier time crossing that gap than you might, you know, at least uh, than we, we would have uh, assumed before we knew this. TV sitcoms use canned laughter because the sad truth is that happy sounds are infectious. Now comes research that at least partly explains why. It was published this week in the Journal of Neuroscience. A British research team played various sounds, including laughter, to people who were having their brains scanned by a functional MRI machine. All the sounds activated the premotor cortical region of the brain. That area prepares facial muscles to move. And positive sounds like laughter got a much bigger brain reaction than negative sounds like retching. Blech. The announcement of the study specifically mentioned this clip of commentators at a cricket match losing it for some reason. I can't help laughing when I hear it. I don't even know what they're talking about. 35 minutes, hit a fall over the week. He was... <laughs> I guess for goodness sake, stop it. There's Lawrence. <laughs> Lawrence, please. <laughs> be well. So the body may be programmed when we hear laughter to at least smile and possibly even chuckle, chortle, or guffaw. 
might be because social bonding is so important for us humans. <laughs> This is a bomb calorimeter. This is the actual piece of equipment that researchers use to calculate the energy content of either biodiesel or maybe even the potato chips that you had for lunch today. When they calculate the amount of energy, they're going to calculate it in heat units, which would either be joules or calories. I want you to look inside the bomb calorimeter. Inside here, you can see that there's a silver bucket. Water goes all in here. And this is actually the bomb. It's a smaller silver cylinder. What you do is put your fuel sample in there. Then these two electrodes are connected to the bomb. These provide the spark that will ignite your sample. When your sample burns or combusts, that gives off energy. So how is the energy collected, or how, do, how does a scientist figure out how much energy is being given off? Well, it's a closed system. There's a lid here that goes on top of this calorimeter. And what's in here in the lid is a stirrer. The stirrer is going to stir the water that's in this big pool here so that the heat given off from the sample is going to warm the water in a uniform way. This is the temperature probe. This goes down in the water also and measures the change in temperature because as the sample is burned, it will give off heat and the temperature of the water will increase. So the lid goes on, the sample is prepared. The last thing that you need to make a combustion reaction happen is oxygen. And at some point during the process, some oxygen is added by a tank that's connected to the calorimeter here. So we are going to burn a sample of the biodiesel that you've prepared and get some feedback on the energy content of it. You'll be able to use this to compare it to petroleum-based fuels like octane. Why do bumblebees pick some flowers over others? Researchers have known for a while that a flower's color can be a signal. Color is shorthand that says to a bee, hey, I got some good quality nectar here, why don't you stop by for a visit? But new findings show that bees also use color to get clues about a flower's temperature. And according to a study from a British research team published in the journal Nature, some like it hot. Bees use up a lot of energy just staying warm on some days. In fact, they can't even fly if they're too cold. So if one flower is warmer than another, a bee can save some of its fuel by basking on that flower while it's doing its pollinating business. And it turns out that bumblebees consistently do choose warmer flowers over cooler ones, even when the two flowers offered up the same quantity and quality of nectar. Some plants seem to be evolutionarily adapted to be slightly warmer because the warmer ones get visited more by the chilly bees. When it comes to getting pollinated, apparently the heat is on, and that's the buzz. Thirdly, life from non-living matter. And this illustration often used is the one of the monkeys at the typewriter. Okay, so we have a monkey sitting at a typewriter, and the claim here is, basically, if you leave chance and time long enough, you will get life, don't worry about it. Yes, it's strange, yes, it's wonderful, but leave enough matter, 600 million years on Earth, and you will have life. So the monkey's sitting at the typewriter, and the chances are, eventually, he produces the complete works of Shakespeare, so what's the problem? So there's no problem, there isn't an issue, right? You just leave him long enough, you'll be fine. And at one keystroke a second, the monkey might well eventually get to the complete works of Shakespeare, but he doesn't manage to do it in 600 million years. So what I decided to do to run the numbers is I, instead of saying type the complete works of Shakespeare, I just ran the numbers for how long would it take a monkey typing at one keystroke a second to type to be or not to be, that is the question, right? On average, how long is it going to take my monkey friend at one keystroke a second? I don't know how long you think that would be. Maybe you could have a guess. Would it be less or more than 600 million years, which is the period life on Earth is supposed to have emerged within? 
And when I ran the numbers, to be or not to be, that is the question, takes 12.6 trillion, 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 trillion years to type just that phrase. And a DNA string, which you have to have for like the life we have now, doesn't emerge in, it's, it's not like a sentence's worth of information. A DNA string has got as much information as the Encyclopedia Britannica. Right? So if we're saying that emerged, something of that complexity emerged by chance, undirected, within 600 million years, again, it's mathematically possible, but it's so incredibly unlikely that it would have that it tilts me in favor of the Christian story in which God creating life is simply a question of saying, let there be, and there was. 